commercials, records, the whole thing. So that was kind of how I got my comeuppance. Any particular examples that you want to cite? I did a, a, I did a quirky Coen Brothers movie called um, uh, called um, The Naked Man. Crazy October. I don't know what October films ever did with it, but uh, starring um, oh, what's that guy's name with the Brooklyn accent, the blonde hair. Uh, he was in True Romance. Anyway, um, and um, that was a pretty cool thing. I, I did that. Recorded a song with Delbert McClinton, who I've always loved, uh, in that film um, for that movie. Ethan and I became really tight because he's a big guitar fan too. So uh, yeah, uh, Ethan. did that. Ethan Cohen. So uh, we, we got pretty tight and, um, you know, in the 80s, I'll really date myself now. Don't ask me how old I am. I played in Debbie Gibson's band. Deb's great, you know. People will say to me, where are you playing? A mall? And I'd be like, no, 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 no. This, she's in the Guinness Book. She's the youngest person to write, produce, and record a number one hit. We ain't talking about Tiffany. No offense, Tiffany. Um, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, lately I've been, everything just kind of fast forwarded. Lately, things have been really, really great this year. I work with Vanessa Carlton. It was all recording there. Um, Is the boyfriend still producing her? Yeah. yeah. And she signed with Irv Gotti now. I know that. I know. So I, I work a lot in the Irv Gotti camp with Seven Aurelius. I was in the studio. I was at pup, Puppies All Night last night. And then I'm working on the new Ashanti record today also with him. And, um, then another session today for Puppy television. Recording with Ashanti? No, we're recording. I'm just using the it, studio. They're recording in Puppies, yeah. Right. And Seven is, is producing and writing. He, he wrote and produced every song of hers. Um, what about that? Next. Okay. So, all right, so Craig came to you to get guitar lessons, mm -hmm. basically. In the and, early 90s. And what was it that you. Basically, we're just teaching him how to play songs he liked. He was bringing songs to you. I think that that's a real good way to learn. I mean, you've got to have some kind of structure and some kind of goal to get good at anything, I think, in life, you know. Um, so, uh, you need to focus in. And, and guitar requires a tremendous amount of skill to execute the art, you know. It's, it's like we all know how to write and we all know how to, to use a, a we, we could all paint something right now, but we can't all make the guitar sound like something right now. You know? So, uh, yeah, so I was, I was suggesting that. I, that's kind of a thing I do with my students is tell me what you like. We'll custom make the material for you. Because I find that people, as far as teaching goes, um, it's kind of like, the student tells a teacher, the way I do it, the student tells me, I'm like the boatsman, you know? It's like, you tell me where you want to go, you get on the boat, I steer, and you row. That's how it works, so. Do you remember what he said, where he wanted to go? I don't really, know. I mean, I think he just wanted to play better, you know? That's a, a common, pretty common thing. Um, he just had a passion for it. I mean, Craig's a very talented guy. People ask me at parties and things over the years because of the teaching thing. They'll say, oh, you teach. They go, well, what about the ones that come through your door that aren't talented? Okay. And the, the, the true answer to that is nobody makes it to my door who's not talented. I can't explain that. It's just, that's the way it's always been. He said that one of the first songs that he wrote was a lullaby for his daughter. Do you remember doing any of that with him? I remember all of it. So the first one I think was Juliana. Juliana, because Juliana, Isabella that's wasn't here yet. That's right. So what did he bring you? How did the song evolve? Did, what was the process that you started out writing this together? Well, what I recall about that is, I mean, you know, Juliana was really Craig's song. I mean... I can't remember my contributions creatively to it. I think that my my contribution to that song compositionally was below ten percent. You know, uh, maybe maybe zero. 
I really acted as a ranger, producer, you know, uh, kind of like, I guess, an editor, a great creative writer, you know, I was doing that. And I said, well, let's get Joe Lynn Turner, who's a friend of mine, who uh, Joe was, uh, I met Joe doing jingles at J John Silverman Music. And uh, he, he just, we just really hit it off. And I was writing over there with their top, a friend of mine, Chris Palmero, who's a genius, who's written, he wrote the NBC movie, The Week theme and whatever, you know. And Chris made millions in writing jingles and retired. And sorry to out you on that, Chris. And, uh, and uh, I brought, Joe, Joe and I had collaborated on a couple songs. Just and I brought him in as a singer. For the purposes of this, just say who Joe and Turner Joe and Turner, Joe and Turner is a singer originally from New Jersey, a rock singer. And Joe's, uh, Joe really kind of got catapulted into the, the limelight when Richie Blackmore, the lead guitarist and lead and leader uh, and principal creative force in Deep Purple, uh, left Deep Purple and formed his own group called Rainbow. He got Riley James Dio, and then that didn't work out after a couple of records, I guess. And then he got Joe. I guess they auditioned people. I don't know the story there. Joe will tell you. Uh, and Joe had a few hits with Rainbow that he wrote. Street of Dreams, Stone Cold. I think they were both top ten hits. Um, and Joe's just an incredible singer. He's like one of the few singers I've ever worked with, and I work with a lot of great ones, that require very little vocal editing. I'll just leave it at that. So, okay, hold on. Do you want to eat? No, this is good. I okay. can eat in a minute. Um, so, all right. So, you brought Joe in to sing Juliana. And then... Uh, and yeah, so he was hired as a session singer. That, right, so he was hired as a session singer. So, at what point did this start to become more serious with the two of you from a songwriting point of view, would you say? That's kind of hard to... Uh, uh, Craig might be able to refresh my memory on that, although I don't trust his memory any more than I trust my own. Um, I think maybe Craig really liked the experience when Joe came in. Um, actually, let me just circle back to one quick thing. Craig wrote an instrumental song that, this is probably in 93 or 94, he started working on his creative thing, an instrumental guitar piece called, to this day, CMH1. This was before Juliana or after? This was That's before. This was before, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. And I wouldn't remember that had he not been over my house the other night saying, do you have a copy of CMH1? So I said, yes. And I went into my dat drawer and, you know, I was flinging tapes out of the drawer. He was in the other, in my studio. And I was like, so, we were kind of like, Phew, because. Was you know, that the we, only copy of it? We didn't have it backed up. Uh, there might have been two deaths. I think we mixed at Sony. Um, but we, uh, we went into Unique Recording. Bobby Nathan's a friend of mine. And Bobby owned Unique Recording here, which is one of, was one of the top, you know, three studios here. You know, they, they had zillions of platinum records on the walls, you know, from Steve Winwood back in the High Life to Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, everything. And Bobby and Joanne, Nathan owned that place. So I booked in there, got a decent rate, got a discount. And I hired uh, uh, some friends of mine who were great musicians. David Santos from Billy Joel's band played bass. Louis Appel, who's another veteran, played drums. And Dave Rosenthal, who's actually with Billy Joel now, played keyboards. So we brought those guys in, and they did a great job. And that was actually the first thing. I think Craig liked the process. I think he really enjoyed going in and like bringing his creativity to fruition. You mean we, the recording process? Yeah. In other words, saying, going from, I wrote this thing, and then I would help him with the arrangement, because Craig tends to write in, uh, in sections. Like, if you have an A section, a verse, a B section, uh, a chorus, a C section, a bridge, typical rock pop song, right? Craig will write A, B, C, D, E, and F sections. <laughs> and I'll help him either string them together or make suggestions and you know uh, about how things can go together, what might be omitted, 
and he's great at listening to all that. And, and he was really good after a, a short time, Craig would start to go, well, let me just save these other two sections for something else. So, uh, you know, that was kind of how, that's kind of how his process goes. So when did Stargazer start to happen, or was it, was there a first song that related to the Galileo stuff you'd been reading that he brought in that you remember? And well, how did that work? again, you know, I, 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 Craig and I were hanging out a few nights ago, we hadn't hung out in quite a while, and uh, I think, you know, I don't think it was even in, in anticipation of, of this interview, but uh, I, I got my memory refreshed a little bit on that. Um, I think the first Stargazer song that we actually had someone sing was Not on the Run, which is, you know, Craig still feels is really politically incorrect. And I think he's like, no, 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 we can't put that on there. But it's a really cool song. And I used Britt Savage to sing it, who I've been working with. Britt won the. This is back in the Star Search days. Britt won the Grand Championship, but she was a she was a a, a total uh, a ringer. I mean, she was a session singer. She was doing big dates, you know, and her agent sent her on the Star Search thing. So, so she did a great job, and that was just me playing Craig's twelve string Taylor acoustic guitar, a couple of tracks, and Britt singing. And that's the whole thing. But she sang her ass off on it, and it sounds great. It's very very cool. I don't know if you've heard that. I have. I just yeah. heard it last yeah, She night. sings her ass off on it, right? You just found it because you had it, I guess, because I hadn't heard it. Before. Hey, I just found it. Yeah. <laughs> but how did the songwriting process go? Again, you came in with stuff in sections and you were... Not on the run. Together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, great, great question. Not on the run was another one that was... I had a little bit more compositional input on that, but still not that much. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of chord changes. Uh, the religiously inspired line, they, uh, that melody there. Um, but the rest was all Craig. That was all Craig. You know. And he, he really had that one together. I mean, that was just, you know. Do you remember was, what followed that? Oh, my God. I mean, I Craig's sitting behind you. Craig, help me out. Well, why don't I take you through some of the songs, okay. and then that will refresh you, because I heard them in a certain order after it had all come together and okay. after the performance at the Asia House and so forth. Was that order Obviously, put together for you? What? The was that order put CDs? together? Uh, no, I, th I don't think so. I think okay. this is an order that you just had, the okay. 22 songs. All right. But um, I think it's chronological. It's not in the order that we that they were written, but it's in the order that I think made sense for the story. Awesome. Understood, yeah, that's what I, I, that's what when I thought. When I first heard about this, Craig said to me, I've written a rock opera yes. about Galileo. Yeah. So at what point did you realize it was a rock opera? I mean, after how many songs were written? And we can go through the songs individually because I want to hear what you say about each, but. Man, you ask great questions. I, I wish I had the answers, but maybe, as you say, it'll jar my memory. Okay, well, how often did you get together with them? It be, I mean, it was definitely once a week, but then once we started in production, and there were different permutations of production. Mm -hmm. The last permutation of production, for example, was, we need you for a month, we need you to turn down other stuff, lock out. Cool. Who's and then, we? Craig, I think that, I think that, uh, I remember Craig telling me that he spoke to, uh, uh, he had spoken with Bob Robert De Niro about Stargazer and he said, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So I think it kind of got, I think it was kind of like Tribeca-ish, mm -hmm. you know? This wasn't the talk with the rabbi and the science. No, this was before that. Okay. No, this was before that. Uh -huh. Um, and I think Craig was kind of excited that people were going, yeah, you know, let's, let's get behind this and, and get this going, you know? So when I say they, I mean the, the collective they of mm -hmm. Craig and whoever his people are that make me say they. <laughs> right. 
So Whoever it is. you had to lock yourself out for a month. I mean, you well, that was towards the end, yeah. Right. 